Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There's a story of a young boy who was at a church with his mom, and the pastor got up and prayed, and he said something along the lines of, Father, uh, remind us that we are but dust. The son, you can imagine, started pulling on his mom's coat. and said, Mom, what is butt dust? Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think sometimes that's kind of how prayer feels, right? Um, it feels a little bit like, what are we doing here? Right? right? What is this? What, is it, what does it mean to talk to God? What, what are we doing uh, when we talk to God? What are we doing when we interact with God? And I think that's a little bit uh, of the tension of prayer, Right? And yet, we understand how uh, prayer is distinctly and deeply powerful, right? Uh, we, we get that. I mean, we are a church of, of prayer that's deeply rooted in prayer. There's another story. This is not humorous. There's another story uh, of a young woman that grew up in, uh, in Latvia under the communist regime. And uh, this great scholar named Kenneth Bailey went over and was doing some teaching in Latvia after communism fell. And uh, there was this group of, of young people that this young woman was a part of. And he heard that she uh, was a follower of Christ at this time. And so he's interested in how she became a follower. And so he goes to her and he said, you know, was it someone in your family uh, that led you to Jesus? That, was it someone in your family that was a follower of Christ? And she said, no, uh, you know, I never met another follower of, of, of Jesus. And nobody in my family followed Christ. He said, well, was it a church that was, um, that was still operating under the communist re regime? Like, was it an underground church? And she said, no, I don't know of any such churches. And, and then he said, well, was it a missionary that came? And, and uh, she said, no, no, no missionary came that I'm aware of. And so he's perplexed at this time. And he says, okay, well, can you tell me um, how you became a, a follower of Christ then? And she said, well, we would go to funerals. And at the funerals, they would still allow us to say the Lord's Prayer. And she said, as we recited the Lord's Prayer, as we, as we said these words, God stirred something so deeply in me and, and drew me to himself. And as we said this prayer, she said, I needed to know this God. Right? There's something powerful in the words of the Lord's Prayer. It, it introduces us to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. If you've been with us over the last few weeks as we started this series, this is week three of the series. Uh, if, you, if you were with us over the last few weeks or a couple weeks of that, uh, we looked at the first couple of verses of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and they'll be on the screen. We'll, we'll see just a, a little bit kind of of the opening. What we looked at is that the foundation, go ahead, Karen, uh, the foundation of the, the Lord's Prayer is, is rooted in our Father, right? And what we said is like, in, in order to understand what, why we start with our Father, we've got to look at the Scriptures. We have to go to the Scriptures and ask the Scriptures what they say about God being our Father, right? And, and so then we learn that His name is holy, that, that, that our Father is, is sacred, and He is set apart. We dove in last week. And we dove into that second line there, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what we realize is this part of the prayer is a, is a deep longing for God, for more of God, not only to make his name great and holy as it is, but to change the world to reflect a, a little bit more of heaven on earth, Right? And so we, we dove into that, but, we, but to go a step further, we didn't just say, we, we don't just pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it, is, as it is in heaven, and then sit on our hands, right? What we realize is that as we pray that, it's an invitation to actually get involved in the prayer that we're praying. And so your kingdom come, your will be done right here, right now, and we get to play a part in that. 
And so the next part of that prayer that we're looking at, the, the three more petitions that we're diving in, the first were all about God, right? God, make your name holy. Make your name great, right? God, make your kingdom come. God, make your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Today and over the next three weeks, we're, the, the parts we're looking at deal with us. Right? They deal with kind of us, the body of Christ, the disciples back then, followers of Jesus now. And, and, and what we'll see is, God, give us this day our daily bread. God, forgive us. God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so these next three petitions that we're going to look at are, are where we're going to begin diving deeper into this prayer study together. And so let's pray. Father, as we dive in, and we keep looking into the, the, these words that Jesus um, so eloquently taught the disciples 2,000 plus years ago. Father, I pray that you would make them alive for us. God, I pray that you would, uh, you would help us to have a greater understanding of, of the depth of these words. They're not just words on a page or just words that Jesus taught the disciples that, that, that transcend to us all these years later. But there are words that we can live by, words that we can pray by, words that we can serve by. Uh, and so, Father, I just pray that you would make yourself known even more now as we keep diving in today. God, we love you. We desperately need you. And so, Lord, just uh, make your word uh, come alive for us. And so, Father, as always, I pray you would speak through me and your people would hear you and not me. I pray you would help us to leave this place different than when we walked in. We love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, we're looking at this verse 11 we'll get to in just a moment. We're talking about daily bread. And this, uh, this, this phrase, daily bread, or the words daily bread in the Greek are the words epiusias. I don't expect you to spell that. But I want you to understand the depth of this because that word is only used two times in all of Scripture. It's used right here in Matthew chapter 6. It's used in Luke chapter 11, both when Jesus is teaching on the Lord's Prayer. And if you go back and look at this, this word back then is actually an unknown word. It's a word that they don't really have a description for. And so as I went back and looked into ancient literature to find out a little bit more uh, of exactly what this word meant and to unpack the distinctness of this word, there's almost nothing about it. And there's not a lot about what it means. And, and so we know, because we have the translation now, that it means daily bread. But for the disciples, for the early followers of Jesus, what they would say is, is God, give us the spiritual sustenance we need to survive today. Right? Give us the, the, the spiritual sustenance we need to survive today. In 1914, there was a scholar by the name of Adolf Deisman. And Adolf Deisman unpacked a bag, and he found this shopping list. And on this shopping list, it had the word epiusius, daily bread. And for the first time in, in, in centuries, this centuries-old puzzle about what this word was, meant was solved, right? It, it means daily bread. It means uh, fresh bread, right? Not bread that was baked yesterday, not bread that you find in the back of the store, on the rack in the back of the store, right? It was bread that was made for today, or today, for today. And that's what it means. And so Jesus comes along, and as, as he's saying this, right, he, he invites us to pray for the stuff that we need today in order to survive. But here's the problem. Here's what I was convicted by. I, as your pastor, I'm trying to live by what I've challenged you to, right? That you pray this prayer every morning and every evening. And so every morning, as I'm laying there before my feet hit the, uh, hit the floor, hit the bed, right? Hit the floor. <laughs> before they hit the floor, I'm trying to pray this prayer. And as I'm praying this prayer, and as I get to this line in the prayer, give us today our daily bread, here's what I'm challenged by. Once my feet hit the floor and I walk through uh, the family room or the living room, through, through, through the hallway, to, through the, the living room and into the kitchen, and I open my fridge, you know what's in there? Tons of stuff. I go down just a little bit further and I open my pantry and I open that, right? And what's in there? Tons of stuff. And so when I begin thinking about, God, give us this day our daily bread, when I already have a full fridge and a filled belly, 
What does it mean for us? Right? What, what does it mean for us? And most of us can resonate with that same question, right? Let's be honest. As we think through this prayer, as we dive into this prayer and we kind of dissect it, here's the, here's the thing. There are people all over the world that have never prayed this prayer and yet they eat every meal. There are people all over the world that pray this prayer all the time and yet they're starving. You see the tension in this? And so we've just got to be honest, don't we? How do we... As followers of Jesus, uh, those of us in this room that are seeking to pursue Christ, how do we come along and pray in all honesty, in all sincerity, pray, give us today our daily bread? When most of us have full bellies and filled fridges. Right? How do we pray that? And so what's the point of this prayer? Here's what I see Jesus getting at. Here's what I see about prayer. The reality is this. That prayer transforms the world we live in, and it shapes the people we become. Right? Prayer transforms the world we live in, and it shapes the people we become. Uh, I want to take you back to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, a familiar verse uh, on, on prayer, uh, on, on revival we've talked about. Right? Here's what it says. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and what? And pray. Right? And pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then my response, right, as the Heavenly Father, what will his response be? I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. In other words, God says, I'm going to transform them and I will transform the world they live in. This happens how? By prayer. It happens because we start seeking the face of God and we start listening for the voice of God. Let me say it like this. Prayer transforms the prayer and then releases them in power. Right? Prayer transforms the prayer. That's us, right? And then releases us in power. And so this morning, I want to give you just a few things about that praying, give us this day our daily bread. Even when we have full bellies and filled refrigerators, what it actually does for us. I want us to answer as we dive into this, the question of why pray this if we already know where our next meal will come from? Why pray this if we already know where our next 12 meals come from? Why, why, what's the significance of this? And so let's look at this verse in verse 11. Here's what Jesus says. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Here's what Jesus wants to do. Here's what I want you to understand as we dive in. Is Jesus wants to ground us into the glorious present. Jesus wants to ground you into the now. Not ground you like, hey, go to your room, right? Not like that, right? Anybody do that? No? Just me? Man. Y'all are easy, huh? But he's, he wants to ground us into the present, into the here, into the, the now. He wants to break us out of the fact that so many of us in this place, right, live in a tainted past or into an anxiety-ridden future. And, and he says, I, I really want to plant your feet into the now. I want to plant your feet into the, the present. And the emphasis in this message, right, in this part of it that we're looking at is on the right now, the, the, the today. God, give us what we need. We, we simply pray right now. And that's what Jesus is inviting us to. It's, it's part of it. It leads us to the reality that, that God loves relationship, right? God loves connection with us. That's why Jesus said in John 15 when he's talking about the vine, right? Here's what he says. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That's what this is all about. When we pray, give us today our daily bread. Give us our daily bread. We are connecting ourselves to God in the now, in, in, in the present. I, I, and we're saying, God, I need to hear your voice. God, I need to feel your touch. God, I need to sense your leading. God, I need to receive your provision. God, not tomorrow. I, I need it right now. And let's be honest, some of us in this room, some of us watching right now online are riding a spiritual wave that crested and broke years and years ago. 
And this epiusius that we're talking about, this, this daily bread is what you need. Right? You, you need to be drawn back to the Father on, on a daily basis. Right? You need the daily bread. It's bread for the moment. It's bread for today. And so Jesus comes along and he says, you don't need to live on stale bread. You don't need to live on, on the, the bread that's in the back of the store on the little rack back there, right? You, you don't need to live on, on day-old bread. I want you to live on bread that's made today. So come to me now. Come to me in the present. I love, I love the way that the great preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones puts it. He said, the God who made heaven and earth and orders the stars in their courses likes to hear our lisping praises, likes to hear our petitions. Isn't that good news? That, that our Father in heaven wants to hear from us, desires to hear from us, cares about what is on our heart, right? If it's on our heart, it's on his too. He, he loves to hear us. Let, let me say it like this. Being present leads to enjoying his presence. Be, being present with the Father leads to enjoying his presence. And that's what it's about. Because right now, in this moment, it's the only time you can enjoy God's presence. Right? Right now, in this moment, it's the only time you, you can enjoy God's presence. Right now, in this moment, are you catching it? It's the only time you can enjoy God's presence jesus says give us this day our daily bread and here's the thing many of us right we would we would love to pray god give us this next year god give us what we need whatever we need whenever we need it and what, what, what god says is no i want that connection right i want that every day i will give you enough provision for today, and then let's talk again tomorrow, because I love to hear your voice, and I want you to know me, and I want to be known by you. Isn't that powerful? That, that, that our Father in heaven wants to be known by you. And I'm sure somebody, when we say this, is thinking, well, you're a planner, right? You're an organizer. You, you like to schedule things out. And you say, well, should we not plan? Should we just simply trust God in every day and then no, make no provision for anything else? I'm glad you asked the question, right? Because Dallas Willard answers it for us. Here's what he says. Now, to make it clear about the teaching on prayer, it's quite all right to have things now that we intend to use tomorrow and to work or even pray in a sensible way for them. What hinders or shuts down kingdom living is not the having of such provisions, but rather the trusting in them for future security. He goes on, he says, we have no real security for the future in them, but only in the God who is present with us each day. Isn't that powerful? It's good stuff. It's not what we have, right? It, it's what we trust in. It's it's who we trust in that's the de determining factor. Here's the way Jesus goes on again. Verse 11, here, here's what he says. Give, right? Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And as I was thinking through that first part of this, right, this, this give, right, as I've been praying through this prayer and, and began to think, God, you already provided it though, right? God, you already gave it. And what I sense God is saying is then praise me in the moment for what I've already given you. Right? Give me glory for what I've already given you. I've been good to you. I'm being good to you. And now that you're praying for it, you are beginning to realize I've already provided it. Here's the first thing that prayer did, right? It, it creates a presence in the moment. The, the second thing it, it, is it does is it causes us to be aware of blessings which leads to deep gratitude when we're aware of our blessings it leads to deeper gratitude it creates an awareness of the blessings we already have when i pray for that for what i already have i become aware of all that god has graciously given us this type of prayer has led me to this realization that an abundance of products that we have that we're surrounded by begins to erode our awareness of God's provision. Let me, let me say it like this. 
God's consistent goodness sometimes erodes our ability to see his goodness. You follow what I'm saying? Sometimes God's consistent goodness erodes our ability to see his goodness. Here's how I know that. Very few of us get up in the morning, we take a breath, and we think, wow, thank you, God, for this breath in my lungs. Thank you for the oxygen, the air, right? Thank you for allowing us to take a deep breath. Thank you that my heart is still beating, right? This is a miracle. We, we, we so often don't praise God for the, the, the small things that we forget about in life. And all of these things are gifts of God, but his consistent goodness sometimes erodes our ability to see his goodness. The last three or four Sundays, I've woken up with, with a, a strained voice, a voice that felt like it was going, going out, almost gone. And, and, and here's what I'll tell you. I woke up thinking, oh no, Lord, you've got to do something. But I'll tell you this, the, the dozens of Sundays before that, I never once got up and said, Lord, thank you for my voice. Thank you that it feels normal. Thank you that it's not going to strain today. See the difference? His goodness sometimes erodes our ability to see it. His consistent goodness. All of this life is grace. And here's what happens. When we become aware, the most natural thing that flows out is, God, you are amazing. God, I am so thankful. God, you are so good. We started this this morning by asking this question, should we really pray this if we have a full belly and a filled refrigerator, right? And the argument, of course, is absolutely, right? Jesus teaches us this. And here's why, because back to the beginning, not only does it transform the world we live in, but it transforms the people that we become. It grounds us in, his, in the glorious present. It allows us to enjoy the relationship with God. It allows us to become aware of all the blessings that God has given us and to respond with gratitude. You see, an awareness of God's uh, provision always should be an invitation to a life of gratitude. Finally, here's what Jesus says again, verse 11. I want to break it down again. Give us this day our daily bread. You know what's ca caught by, captivated by, convicted by? Is that as I prayed this part of the prayer, as I, as I prayed through this prayer over and over and over again each week, each day, as I began to look at this, that, that every time, every place there's a pronoun, it's plural. You ever caught that? Every place is a pronoun, it's plural. Our Father, right? Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses or debts. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. And what I was convicted by as I began to pray this and really study this, this prayer that Jesus taught us, is how many of my prayers, how many of our prayers are me-centered. And here's the challenge. If you want your prayer life to model after what Jesus teaches us, we can't only pray for me. Right? It breaks us outside of our egocentric bubble and it springs us into the world that God has created. Give us this day our daily bread. We talked about this last week, right? Praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we're praying that, it naturally, when we're praying it uh, uh, genuinely, right, it naturally launches us into being uh, part of the solution to the prayer that we're praying. And the same is true when we begin praying, give us this day our daily bread. Here's what it does. We can't pray, give us this day our daily bread with all sincerity if we don't care about people that don't have enough, right? 
God begins to stir something in our heart, right? God begins to stir something in, in our soul as we pray that. And one of the huge benefits of, of prayer and the way that Jesus taught us to pray is that it ties us together not only with our needs individualistically, but also the needs of the entire world and the entire faith community that we are part of. And what I've found, watch this, is that it's really difficult to judge somebody and pray for them at the same time. Right? You, you can try it, but be ready for the Lord to smack you. you. You can try to judge and pray for the person, but it's nearly impossible. And here's what happens. Solidarity with people in need creates a mission in our soul. It stirs it up. It sends us out. It's why so many of, of the people in our congregation are helping with our Gathering Hope mentoring program, right? It's why so many uh, of you serve in youth ministry or kids ministry. It's why uh, when you heard the need a few weeks ago about the, the lack of, of our mission support through that part of the year, our church stepped up in a huge way, right? It's why some of you are going to head to Ghana or Guatemala next summer, right? It's why so many of you uh, serve every year at Vacation Bible School because you begin to pray and God begins to put this on your heart. God begins to open the door. God begins to push you to step into the mission, right? Because you're praying and you're going, God, how do we become part of the solution to the problem? God, how do we give us this day our daily bread? And prayer is where it's birthed. You show me somebody who prays, give us this day our daily bread with sincerity and I will show you somebody who doesn't just think about themselves right but who's engaged with the needs of the people around them there's a story about this monk that left his commune I know that sounds like it's gonna be a joke it's not okay <laughs> But this, this monk left his commune and he went to the mountains for a, a little while by himself to seek the Lord. And he comes back to this commune. He stands, uh, steps back into the commune with the other monks. And one monk looked at him and he said, you don't look any different. And the monk said back to him, he said, but you do. Right, see that right there, that is the power of prayer. It's not so much that it changes uh, us in a way that people can always see, but it changes the way that we see people. The types of prayers we pray det determines the type of people we become. And for two, two millennium, right? We, we talked about this last week. We, uh, when we came to the Lord's table, for two millennium, followers of Jesus have been coming to that table. They've been coming to that table to remind themselves that we live by bread, but we don't live by bread alone. That we come to the table to remind ourselves that at this table for over 2,000 years, that the true bread, the, the true genuine bread that we really need, right, that every single one of us needs is Jesus himself. And the truest bread Jesus gives us is himself. And so when we pray that, give us this day our daily bread. It takes us back to a personal reminder of where that connection begins, right? Our daily bread is Jesus himself. The epa you see us is a relationship with the Father. The epa you see us, the, the daily bread is, is a personal interaction, connection consistently daily with the, our Father in heaven. He is your daily bread. 